Hello, and welcome to this bite-sized session on creating culture. I'm Sharon Young, and I'm going to be sharing with you a few pearls of wisdom that I've gathered over the years when working with a range of different organisations who've been trying to create cultures around customer excellence, mergers, and implementing more flexible and smarter ways of working. To support this session, we've provided you with a handout, and you may find it useful to have this alongside while you're viewing the video. There's space in there for you to complete some of the exercises and also some additional information if you want to read it afterwards. If you like, you might want to pause the video at various points so you can actually work through the exercises in relation to your organisation or your team. So we're talking about culture, but first of all, let's think about what actually is culture? You may have heard the expression which is often attributed to Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well I've certainly thought about a, a few experiences in change programmes where I've seen that happen, where a new change has not been successful because the culture has just not supported it. And I'm sure you can probably think of a few examples yourselves as well. But actually a lot of people take it a stage further. And they say not only does culture eat strategy for breakfast, it eats operational excellence for lunch and then everything else for dinner. And to be fair, when you're thinking about it, it's all about people. And if you don't have people who are committed to the ways of working that you want to implement, then it's never going to be successful. But it's amazing how many organisations don't focus on changing culture. And what I found over the years is one of the main reasons for that is because people find culture a little bit intangible. It's very hard to understand what it is, what makes up our culture and therefore how do we change it. So we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail now. And I want to share with you a story that you may have heard of before which explains the, the paradigm that makes an organisation and how it gets created over the years. I'd like to tell you about an experiment that some scientists did on a group of five monkeys. They put them into a cage and in the centre of the cage there was a ladder and at the top of that ladder there was a big bowl of nice juicy bananas. So as you can imagine before too long one of the monkeys started climbing up the ladder to try and get the bananas. As soon as they started doing that the scientists set off a cold shower that drenched all the rest of the monkeys. So they started beating up the monkey on the ladder to get him off the ladder. As time went on and every time a monkey went up, the rest of the monkeys got the cold shower, that monkey cat started getting beaten up. The monkeys ultimately realised that they didn't really want anyone going up that ladder because they didn't want a cold shower and so they stopped going up. Round about that time, the scientists then replaced one of the original monkeys with a new monkey. As you can imagine, he started going up the ladder. Straight away, he got beaten up by the other monkeys. After a few attempts, he decided that he wasn't going to go up the ladder either. So the scientists then replaced a second monkey, and a third monkey, and a fourth monkey, and every time the same thing happened. And then with a fifth monkey. So we were then left with a whole team of monkeys that were totally different. None of them had ever received a cold shower, and yet none of them made the effort to go up the ladder. Now if you could speak to those monkeys and ask them, why? Why don't you try and get the bananas? They'd probably say something along the lines of, well, I don't really know. It's just the way that we do things around here. Have you ever heard that before? I certainly have in organisations. People don't know why we do certain things. We just know that's the way that we've done it for a long time. And the problem is that the reasons we originally had for doing things a particular way may well have changed. We live in a very fast paced world today. And so what might have been a good reason 10, 5, even 2 years ago might not be the best way to work now. So if that's how culture is demonstrated and created, what does it actually look like from a, a more practical perspective? Edgar Schein did a lot of work around culture. And one of the main problems is people say you can't see culture. Because at the basic level, it's about people's assumptions. It's unconscious things that we take for granted about the way that we live our lives generally and the way things are done around here. And what you then find is you have values. And these are quite often the espoused values, what we say about what's expected, our, our ethical standards and behaviours. 
But the problem with both of these things, if you look at this, this diagram of, a, of an iceberg, is they're both beneath the surface. You can't see them, you can't measure them, and that's where it becomes really hard with culture to do anything about it. But actually what you can do something about is above the surface, is what is demonstrable, which is what you experience every day with what you see and hear and feel. So these are the, the practical, physical manifestations of that culture. And so if you're going to try and change a culture, what you really want to do is to look at identifying what are those practical representations. One of my favourite models of looking at culture is The Cultural Web by Johnson and Skoll. And this overcomes for me the issue of things being intangible. This makes it really, really practical. So I'll explain briefly the model, and then I'll look at a couple of examples and get you to think about how that applies to your team or your organisation. So at the centre of the web is the culture or the paradigm in the same way as in the monkey story. It's what makes it different. What is it about how we do things here? What's special about the organisation? And then around the outside, you have the physical representations of that culture. And they work quite well in pairs, actually. So if we start with the organisational structure, that's one that most people look at. And it's probably the most tangible because you can see it on an organisational chart. So how structured are you? Is it quite flat or is there quite a lot of hierarchy and rank in terms of what you do? Do people have line managers or is it very much more matrix management? Do people have very specific job descriptions or things that are a lot more loose and vague? And then you have the organisational structure and the relationships within that, but you also then have the power structures. And the power isn't always necessarily in the most senior roles. There might be certain parts of the organisation or certain individuals that have real, got real pockets of power. Thinking about as well, how are decisions made and how empowered are individuals at the front line to make their own decisions about what they think is best to do in their day to day work. Moving on then, we have rituals and routines. These are the things that we expect to see regularly, that people do often, sort of role modelling that we see. So is it that people work through lunches? Uh, is it that, that people have regular team meetings? What are some of the things that people do without even thinking about it? And then you have your controls, which are your formalised routines. So these are all of your processes, your procedures, your quality management systems, how you manage performance, how you reward people. All of these things are your controls that control the way the organisation functions. And obviously for those of you that are in highly regulated sectors, you'll have an awful lot of things within this controls area. And then the final two points are around symbols and stories. So the symbols are the things that create information and communication about the organisation but without you practically saying anything. So all of your logos and your branding says a lot about the organisation. The state of your offices, do you have um, executive dining rooms or executive corridors that are much nicer than the whole rest of the areas? And then finally stories, which for me are the most powerful area. You can say what you like on an induction about what an organisation is like but it's what people hear from people when they join the organisation about what it's really like to work here that makes a difference. So have a think about what are the stories that people tell about your organisation? Who are the heroes or heroines, the really awful events that happen, the villains of the piece? This is a really, really key part of culture. So let's see this as an example here. If we're looking at a retail bank, so if you're looking at the paradigm at the centre of the cultural piece there, it's about the idea of avoiding risk, definitely not something that was encouraged within retail banks, about being a lifetime employer of that safety, about not making mistakes. And we obviously know as cultures have changed that that idea of the job for life doesn't exist anymore, but it was a core part of the culture in these retail banks a few years ago. And the things that they embedded that was having these regional directors that have had huge amounts of power, had a structure that was very hierarchical, one over the other, very autocratic, having routines where, where people were expected to behave in certain ways, you were meant to be financially sound yourself, um, where you had a lot of processes to follow, people didn't work by exception, they worked by the rules or else. 
It was very much having a head office, very tightly controlled, managers being referred to as Mr. No first names going on there. And stories about if you if you had debts, you were dropped from the, from, the, from your jobs, rivalry at the top, all of those kind of very competitive things. So that's an example within a retail bank. But let's think about how we would use this practically. So there's two ways that you can use the cultural web. The first one is to assess the current culture. And when you're doing that, you start from the outside in. So you look at what exists currently in each of those different strands. Now, the best way to do this is to gather together a group of people from across the organisation and at different levels, because people will see different things. If you just have a small group of senior managers, you're not going to get a full view. So involve lots of people and ask them what you they think exists in each of those strands. doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive, just what exists currently. And from that, then start to look and see what picture is this giving you about what the culture is really like. Not what you want it to be, not what you tell people it is, but what it really is like today. And from that, you then complete the central paradigm. Now, if you're looking to create culture, you do it the other way around. You start from the inside out because you need, in the same way as setting strategy, to think about what does success look like? For us to achieve our, our goals and our aims as an organisation and, and our values and what's important to us, of course, what will people be doing? What is that paradigm going to be like? If people describe our organisation, what are the words that we want them to be using about that? And when you've got some agreement on what's actually in that central paradigm, then start to think about what needs to be in place in all of those outside strands. What are the demonstrable, practical demonstrations of that culture? So what are the routines? What are the things you want people to be doing regularly? What are the levels of controls and, and how exact and controlling do you want them to be? How empowered do you want people to be? Is your structure that you've got currently going to work towards that? So thinking about what's your ideal structure. So all of this to start with is about the ideal. And then when you've looked at the ideal, you need to start thinking about how does that compare to where we are now and to create a gap analysis. So to give you an example of that, if we're looking at implementing a smart working culture, here's some of the things that you might want to have in place. So for your paradigm, it's about work being carried out at the best time, in the best location and in the best way to actually meet your outcomes and your strategies. You might have things about people having clean desks, about people having much more collaborative workspaces rather than split into your own teams. From the power point of view, people are going to be able to choose the best way to do things, when, where and how they work. You're probably going to be using a lot more technology, so a lot more virtual team meetings, a lot of messaging rather than sitting down and having long face-to-face -face meetings. You'll be managing people more by outcomes. So start to think about where you are in comparison to this and add some other things that you think are important for you, for your desired culture. Once you've gone through that process, you then need to start thinking about how does that compare to where we are now? And this is where you need to complete a gap analysis. Now, it's all very well starting to identify, but you really need to do something with it. To change the culture, you need to change the artefacts that drive people's behaviours. And that will take time to do. Whenever you're changing habits, it doesn't happen straight away. And your role models, your leaders, will have a key part in actually how quickly those things change. So you can't just change the culture and assume that it is going to change the culture. So we need to start thinking about what are the things that will drive people's habits. And you then need to start looking at creating a gap analysis of where we are now in comparison to where we need to be. A really great tool for doing that is what we call Stop, Start, Continue, Change. And you'll find this actually in your handout. So to get you to that smart work, working culture, have a think about what are the things that you're doing now that you need to stop? Things that are hindering and they're going to be blockers for you getting to where you want to go. What are things that you're not doing that you really need to start that are going to really support and enable a new culture? What's some of the stuff that you're doing that's already good? You don't need to change everything. You'll have a lot of great stuff in your culture. So what are the things that you want to make sure you carry on doing you don't lose? 
And finally, what are the things that you still need to do, but maybe you need to do differently? So maybe some of your processes that need to be streamlined, your performance management that needs to be more open and more flexible for things. Now you can do this simply by filling in the notes on the handouts, but a really good way if you've got a group of people is to actually put flip charts around the room, one with stop, one with start, one with continue, one with change, and to have groups of three or four people and give them three, four, maximum five minutes at each of the flip charts where they think in relation to your culture, what other things you need to stop, start, continue, change. And people work their way around to each of those different flip charts. And at the end, you pull them back together and have a discussion from that. And from that stage, you obviously then need to think about how do we really put this into action? How do we stop it being a plan and start it being something that we do? And that will be when you hand over to your normal project management or whatever activities you use in your organisation to make things happen. But one final tip for me is if you're going to be building a culture, think about the people whose culture it's going to be. Think back to the monkey stories about the individuals that are participating in that culture. Those are the people that really change it. So for me, get a, as many people as possible involved within that. Get them to start changing their habits. Get them to start changing their stories. Because it's when the stories change that you really know that your culture has changed. I hope that you found this session useful and good luck with creating your new culture.